takes what he's learned in philosophy and applies it to the subject. So they're continuing what they've learned in the university, and they debt someone and they dump it on them, one way or the other. Mm -hmm. That's the first school. And the second school is saying, we just want to be open and free, and it's very much like Carl Rogers in psychology with the right to interpret whatever they're saying in terms of European philosophy. So, in a way, it it preserves their whole tradition and their learning, whereas if they move into what I'm doing, according to that book, I'm saying that European philosophy is not in the same tradition as philosophical midwifery. As a matter of fact, it has no relationship to it. It's independent of it. Just like Greek philosophy is independent of European philosophy, Christian, Christian theology is independent, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, you know. And uh, it gets to be quite, quite vicious at times. You know. And Regina can, and Barbara can say many things, and Julie can say many things about what they know about the hostility against what I'm doing by many of these major players in the ball game. So Marinoff wrote a book and he said that Achenbach is the founder of it. Now Lou Marinoff is the president of the American Philosophical Practitioners Association, of which I happen to be on the board, and one of the co-founders way back when. Co-founder in a, in a, in a way, I was present during its formation and I was one of the early members and we brought it, uh, therefore, into existence. <clears throat> but Lou Marinoff was the genius behind it all, and he brought it into uh, fruition. Got over a thousand members all over the world. And so he gave a talk, he opened up the meeting in New York, and he opened up the meeting by saying, I'd like to make clear about something. He said, I'm an era about who founded the philosophical counseling movement. It is not Hans Achenbach, the Air Grimes started it, and he's the founder of it, and wow. it's uh, his direction that is meaningful. Wow. Mm-hmm. So, I went, nice. wow, yeah. in public, filmed. Wow. So, uh, That's really, interesting. Before you gave your talk, I don't know the, all the implications talk? of it, but, but uh, for him to do that is quite important. Yeah. Was it before you gave your talk, Pierre, or after you gave your talk, or...? He was the first speaker, Ah. so he opened it up with that. Wow. That's something. So it's a Gerd Achenbach with a G-E-R-D. Do you want me to spell it? It's not Hans, it's Gerd. Gerd. Oh, excuse me, what is it? It's, I believe, G-E-R-D Achenbach. I believe his first name is... Could you do it again, please? I think it's G-E-R-D... Could be. What is it? I think so. Jared or Jared. That's right. Jared. That's Jared. right. Thank you. I could. I should get it right. But the Achenbach part is the important part. Yeah. Congratulations for it. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. So he would use it very fine. So where's it going to be in writing somewhere? I, I'm By telling who? you. He has to. He's coming out with another book. All right. But he didn't say us anything to you personally about anything, huh? How he came to that realization, or what? It, mystery, wow. mystery. Wow. And uh, the fun thing about the about the meeting is Jacqueline, who you know, mm. she showed up there, and she went after all the bigwigs there personally and confronted them all and said, "I have two questions. You know, how do you differ from philosophical midwifery, and why aren't you doing it?" <laughs> <laughs> Man, more friends. One, two, three. Wow. So then, uh, good job. That's who I think it is. Nancy? It is who I think it is. Hi. And another guest came in the New York meeting who I have known for, you know, I, how long? I, know, I guess over 50 years. Yeah. Who's that? 50 years? My son. Oh, wow. Peter Grimes walked into the meeting at the. Now, now this is He's not a rel- City a College in New York. This is a, a, a university college that started in the 1840s. 
magnificent, you know, style-wise, all wood and stone and beautifully. We were in the old cathedral, and as we were looking at this cathedral room that we, we gave the talk, one, two, three stained glass windows. Plato, Socrates, Aristotle. Mm, all in the same line. <laughs> wow. wow. That, was the, that was the hall. Wow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Too bad they had. should have been Proclus. <laughs> you know, about 10 feet in height, you know, up there. Mm. <laughs> so my son Peter showed up, and he had a good time. And... Uh, um, I haven't found out what he thought of it yet. I left a couple of messages, but we haven't been able to get connected yet. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, uh, he showed up at the first meeting way back in Washington, D.C., how many years ago? Mm -hmm. 1986. 1986. 86. Washington, D.C., or the first APPA meeting? No, Washington. Oh, in 1986. Yeah. Yeah. So he showed up for this one, and uh, mm. he enjoyed the difference. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And, uh, so. Mm. Your son. So that's the talk. <laughs> All right. Um, and then there was a good drinking and dinner after. Mm. How did your demonstration go? And things like that. Did you get to demonstrate actually philosophical? No, culture? I didn't. I uh, planned on doing several things, but. Uh, I found it would be much more fun just to directly hit them with everything off the table. And <laughs> what does that mean? And I was somewhat rude at times in my boldness and taking certain issues. Could you give us a rundown? Oh, well, you were nice. there five days. Did you have any talks? Yeah. Run down? But, uh, yeah. Um, one of the speakers made the point of. Uh, Plato, after all, defends homosexuality. Oh, God. And uh, he quoted the, the Phaedrus, and he shouldn't have done that. <laughs> Wrong timing. Uh, so to summarize it, I said, you know, this is all a myth. I mean, it's an absolute right for people to relate to whoever they want. But in order to put things straight, I said, you know, the biggest mystery there is is that you are different than everything that you see. Right? Agree? You're different than everything you see. <laughs> right? Therefore, you're confronted with difference all the time, aren't you? Absolutely. And you <clears throat> remain the same. Right? There's something about you that remains. That's the mystery. Same and difference in the universe. I said, by the way, uh, if you get involved with a, someone in the opposite sex, you know one thing, they're sure as hell different than you. <laughs> yeah. And it's quite surprising, you know, because um, I thought the only difference was on their part, the women. <laughs> but now that I've met a couple, uh, they think the difference is on my side, that the problem is my difference. <laughs> so in any case, I was making the point that um, uh, heterosexual relationship means you're willing to confront fundamental differences in worldviews and everything else, and therefore it's a mystery. You're entering into a mystery. And to avoid it in, in uh, same-sex relationships, you, you're, you're losing out on a great mystery and will never grow. Mm -hmm. So I suggested we change the names and identify it the way it really is. And I said, give up the idea that there's any homosexuality. It's really heterophobia. A fear of the other. Fear of, fear of differences. Right. So that went off real well. <laughs> God. But how did you address the... So I, a couple of people made remarks, but didn't go very far. Like you know. that. That's good. Yeah. Uh, and I said, you know, you, you know, if you ask me a question, I'm going to give you an answer. So you better be careful what you ask me. <laughs> Did you address the issue of the Phaedrus no, and homosexuality? Pardon me? Did you address the gentleman with the defense of the Phaedrus? Oh, yeah, I told him he couldn't, yeah, that he needs to learn how to <laughs> get into the Phaedrus with a little more skill than he had shown in his comment. Yeah. <laughs> That's a... Yeah, which is true. Who yeah. was that that did that? 
brought that up. <laughs> that was only one of the board members. Oh, <laughs> oh man. Yeah. That sounds awful. Is he a teacher of philosophy by any chance? Or? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, he teaches at Cliff's Notes. So it was fun. No, it was good. good. That was really good. Looking good. That's a that's a remarkable move. I mean, for them mm -hmm. to see this true basis, because Socrates mentions the very word midwifery. So I would. It is. It's a big step for them. Sure. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. 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 Did you After have reading any? this, well deserved. Yeah. 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 yeah and well, congratulations to Marinoff for yeah. Yeah. collecting his vision. He. It's his. See, because. He has made the public statement that Pierre is a Plato and I am an Aristotle, as he, used to, he says all the time. So. But um, I had fun with him. Um, I said, by the way, I found a way, I think, of finding a way to quantify the Clifford Parallel mm -hmm. diagram on the book. He said, what? And I showed it to him. He said, Jesus, I didn't get beyond the, the second chapter. <laughs> well, that's good. <laughs> I said, there. well, I said, yes, I, I said uh, a lot of people don't get beyond the second chapter. I don't mind, but maybe you ought to look at it. Mm. <laughs> he said, yeah, there's a lot in there. I said, yeah, well, yeah, I'll right. see you around. Yeah, that's yeah. a few year read. That's for sure. Yeah. Mm. But I gave him a puzzle. I said, what is the significance, you see, of the fact that in this work, uh, Apart from the study of the dialectic, there's chaos theory, yeah. right? There's algorithmic theory. Yeah. There's language theories. There's a whole set, and uh, the CAS, of course. Uh, CAS. And also the whole discussion of uh, complex uh, systems. It's called. And so there are all of these di mathematical diagrams in here, and he was pleased to see yeah, that. Taurus. And therefore it shows the relationship between uh, Pathologos functions, the way, the way you can see parallels with uh, wormhole theory in hyperspace. So he said, wow. So I gave him the question, I said, what is the significance of all of these theories being able to be reconciled with and find similarities with philosophical midwifery? And uh, So I, I, I left him with a, a note, I said, my paper I'm doing now, I said, uh, you might find enjoyable. So I'm doing a paper on quantum theory and showing how you can find a philosophical system that can be reconciled with qu quantum theory, which everyone says it's impossible, by the way. Mm. 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 Should be done in two weeks or three, depending upon how much coffee there's in the house. <laughs> I like that should. <clears throat> Could you just explain quantum theory? <clears throat> explain quantum theory? You don't know it? I thought everybody, let me check. Doesn't everybody know quantum no, theory? No, no. <clears throat> <laughs> you don't know quantum theory. Heisenberg, Einstein, when, when Einstein heard about Heisenberg's experiment, he was very upset and he said, God does not throw dice to the universe. Mm. In any case, <clears throat> uh, it's really a very, very curious thing. You have an electron microscope and uh, you're studying the path of an electron, subatomic particle, and uh, In order to see it, of course, you need light. But light has a certain wavelength. And an electron has a certain wavelength. And wavelengths have an inherent force or power. Right? Therefore, the very act of observing this, you're striking it with some kind of power or energy. And therefore, the very act of observation changes its position. 
so that then you can locate its position, but not when it's there. Or you can discover where it is, but not when it is. Well, okay. This has rather curious consequences. Because for the first time, this is saying the act of observing it, that's behind those words is hidden, consciousness. When I observe some, when I observe, my act of observing is an appeal to consciousness. And therefore, for the first time in scientific experiments in subatomic physics, you have to deal with this curious process of what is the effect of the observer on the object being observed. So they now have reduced it to the two-box theory. According to this, this is called a thought experiment, by the way. Therefore, according, now you have to make sense of this, you see, you have to make sense of this. What does that mean? How does it mean? And uh, quantum theory is the most exact system among all of the sciences, far beyond Newton and, and 19th century physics. It is absolutely precise, and now they know that Newtonian 19th century physics, 18th century physics, it's only an approximation and a subjective. So there is no doubt about when they apply what they know to all kinds of phenomena, it works. But trying to explain it is the trouble, like this one. So if you now want to observe something in here, a cell, subatomic particle, right? By focusing, therefore, on it, you will not be able to determine whether it's in this box or this box. Because the very act of observing it changes it. So when you think you're observing this, it ends up here. Now, if you quickly look over here, it's over here. Well, that's very disturbing. Mm -hmm. Now, what sense can you make of it? Mm -hmm. So it's a lovely dance, isn't it? So, so mm -hmm. the the um, does the person always know there are two boxes when he's observing the one? Does assume he know? assume there are two boxes. He knows there are two boxes when he is observing. And assume now that there's a cell or an electron in one of the boxes and you want to observe it. Right. The moment you open it up, you've displaced it. Hmm. Because one wavelength striking another has an effect on it. Hmm. You've already affected it. Therefore, the implication is that you're living in a universe that you cannot be independent of it, see. That's the whole early science up to this point. Yeah, that science means that you are not part of the experiment. You step out of it, the world is, is fixed and mechanical, and you don't have to play any role in the, in, the, in the construction of it or the anticipation of results. It's all fixed. It's called separable. You are separate from the, in the world. Mm -hmm. Here, <coughs> separability is gone. Yep. Cool. That's really cool. Oh. Cool. Yeah, so a guy by the name of Schrodinger took the ele electron out and said, let us do something else. He said, let's assume that there's just one box, and in it is a cat. By the very act of observing it, you've changed it. You could, therefore, it could be changed totally. Or, therefore, the very act of observing it could kill it. But yet, in another way, it, it's still alive because, after all, it could be and the other, as well as, could be both alive and dead. Mm -hmm. how, does, how do you get to the dead point? Pardon? How did you, how did you That's the extreme end of any change. You could, you, oh, okay. you could just call it death. Yeah. <laughs> so, 
<clears throat> there are ten different theories about, there are ten, ten ways of understanding quantum theory, mm -hmm. but the one most accepted is Copenhagen theory, which is forget about theory, it works, just apply it, and forget about everything else. Hmm. Mm -hmm. So. And Copenhagen theory is going to be the one that plays a role in your paper? Uh, a couple of people I'm going to be using. Yeah, a hand up. Yeah, notice so I ducked this, up. Uh, what's the parallel between this and midwifery? I don't know. What's that, mid what? Midwifery. That can't be anything midwifery. What the hell is he talking about? Well, I guess because midwifery. if you look at it. That's a woman who's not sure whether it. she's Mary a wife. <laughs> she's between. Yeah. She's in between. <laughs> Oh, not, one, not quite a wife. Right, quite, but still, but she's yet. getting close she's in to. The quantum, yes. She's getting close to it. <laughs> now she's in that two boxes. <laughs> yeah, she's in those two boxes. So, what's the power yes. of, of looking at your problems? Mm. So anyhow, that's a, that's. A, so you're writing a paper on this? <clears throat> That'd be interesting. I yeah. like the one where they shot the beam and the particle, instead of going straight through, went two different places, but it was still the same particle. Yeah. Yeah, so, so we're still talking. If that's the case, then is there some reflective quality to it? That is, if, I if, don't the, know. Ob what if the object changes, I mean, if you're looking at something, then does it have an effect on the observer? Since the observer can then no. make it change that which it's looking at. Well, consciousness. Uh, Whatever, 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 and whatever, an experience or experience that experience has changed them. So, to answer your question. Yes, yeah, so long as you understand it that way. No, I didn't understand it, but that's if it's that way. I didn't get it. Oh, so, that's a great so we got another dream. We still got some time. We did a little bit. Got a dream with you? No. <laughs> why don't you get? Why don't you give him the elbow? Actually, telling you about Thanks for your dream today, by the way. Yeah, I didn't formally record it. I let it go. None? Yeah. You mean I'm off? Mm. Gee, I heard I you heard. never do that. <laughs> well, once in a while. Okay. Yeah, well, but there's something in there, isn't there? Well, right. I'm used to looking at the. Yeah. The wave yes. that I'm talking about that got me here, one not good after another. One not good after another. Same one. Yeah. Um, that's what it took for me to realize I was on a wave. Oh. I could ride it. Oh. And then there was nothing to do. I have surfed, so I know the wave is eventually going to come in. Yeah. When it did, still it wasn't, it wasn't done yet mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. until I looked for, well, I didn't exactly look, it just came, came. to me, that last piece Good. of, it was my own it was my own light ah, right. that yeah. brought me in. Brought you there? Yeah. All right. Good. 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 Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, nice. we'll take a few minutes break and then we'll go to work. Yeah. 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 It was a way worse. It was way worse. Having that yeah. 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 nice birth. It relationship was way worse. Happy birthday. <laughs> that person. <laughs> yeah. Oh, she brought a cake. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. why it is that what, what well you were asking the question I guess, why is but it I don't yeah. Yeah, that's right. okay. dream is more profound yeah. Yeah. than what we believe it to be and I'm thinking that the very nature Certainly. Of the, the very nature of a dream is a message yeah. that's letting us know that it that we, it's it nice. demanding that we reflect it on nice. it if we I was standing saw in the kitchen it, sink and literally all came in. took it off as if it was 
on its wow. face value, wow. then it wouldn't wow. uh, be reflecting. Wow. It would be a, it was a simple, like, so it could be face value. Wow. However, wow. I'm just looking at so by its very wow. profound, Is by it really the nature, it oh. seems like it's just being profound, the yeah. man yeah. that we reflect yeah. on. Well, and now, I figure if I get in the same. Well, everything you're you know, saying can be true, but it didn't For weight. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. If you're yeah. into surfing, okay. how would you address it? Okay, how we, it's, yeah, so you know, waiting in. Uh, I started every question out with. I don't want to. Do that. Or I'm no expert, but <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> missed the rest of the bad parts. I skipped the, I was able to once I recognized it, I was able to skip the bad parts. I thought uh, this evening we'd do something curious, right? And therefore it will be obvious. How can it be both curious and obvious? Mm -hmm. But look, her. take the myth and the Phaedrus. Outline it. See, outline it. Describe any process that takes place in the myth. Uh, show the flight, the struggle. Indicate the reasons for the rise and the fall. <coughs> when you outline it, you must be very careful to position all of the parts, as it were, the geography. Right? So, because I have it from a couple of good sources that there's some people that want to build a computer model of this, you see. Put it on a DVD, so you may be asked for. So therefore, when you outline it, you see, uh, not just a map, but you want to also, since it's a flight, a, a process, you want to indicate all that can be seen And there's some final vision of anything. What is it? So, well, let's assume for the moment we've done it. Okay? Whew. A lot of work, wasn't it? Boy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, look, suppose for a moment then. Um, We can say there's a hierarchy of items in the myth, some higher, some lower, because the whole thing is a flight to get to the highest. So let's assume now we have all of the things listed, including this sub-celestial arc and the supra-celestial arc and the heaven and etc. All right, let's, make, let's assume that's there. Then we have to talk about the process and the struggle. And we have to, since there's some fall and some finally make it, what's the reason cited for the rise and fall of some of the souls going up and some down? And why the struggle? Because after all, this is really a journey of the soul. Uh, and uh, demons and gods. So, 
you might want to know, isn't it foolish for Socrates or Plato to have included gods and daemons? I mean, just, he didn't need to. And when he has the uh, flight to heaven, they're ordered by Zeus charging ahead and the other gods behind him. And in each one, there are different souls appropriate to each one, each one of the gods. Um, why does he have the gods going into some banquet in the heavens? <coughs> Wait a minute, let's change that. Is it possible that for everything we have described, there can be a reason for it being where it is? <clears throat> so after you get the myth, is it possible then that there is a way of understanding precise way of positioning everything that we have listed. Such that there is a necessity for each, both the things and the processes they go through to be where they are doing what they're doing. Now, stress this one word, necessity, okay? And there should be, therefore, a precise way of positioning everything. And that means there has to be some way <whistles> See, what we need is something over here that is a precise, carefully drawn sketch that we can then apply to show the necessity of every other piece. Hmm. Let me go a step further. What if what what if what we can find in Proclus is that he's going to provide a metaphysics? That's not really a good word, you know, that's Aristotle. Right? Elements of theology. He's going to construct an elements of theology where everything he's going to be saying about the nature of reality The nature of the good, or the one, the whole relationship of monads, the whole relationship of a vision of reality as intelligible, and it's going to include, therefore, the uh, dynamics of the soul. And it struggles.
It has to be so well ordered. Hey, it has to be so complete that for everything here it has to be where it is because it fits into the. In other words, what if Plato's myth and the Phaedrus is a very clever way of personifying his metaphysics? Or put it another way, what if the metaphysics, therefore, is, is crafted, is crafted as a myth, yet retaining, yet retaining the whole structure? And this whole thing has to be ordered hierarchically. Right? That's what he's doing. So, the easiest way to test this, easiest way to test this, is to go for something that seems to you to be so totally against this that you simply couldn't possibly fit it into them. Take a piece of the myth that certainly doesn't look like there could be anything metaphysical about the darn thing, and we'll go there. Or take something that's obvious, and we'll use that, and then we'll be bored. <laughs> right? Well, we'll feel good about being bored. So, so, yeah, all right, okay, one or the other. So look, so you do it, see? Now, the difficulty you're going to have, difficulty you're going to have by doing this, right, is to, we're testing it, see? Just, if we had the myth now in front of us, and you were to give us a number, right, any number, right? The numbers match all the words in the milk. Right? And say you put 102. Well, the 102nd word is describing something. We'll take that. In other words, make it true, as arbitrary as you can if you want. The difficulty, however, remember, is going to be this. And this is why Proclus is a tough read. He's going to do this. Then therefore, he's going to take any piece, and I, uh, let's take the sub-celestial. Arc. All right, he has an arc. Does he need that idea? Couldn't it exist without it? Is there any necessity for it? Should it be a sub? What the heck is... Why not just call it a celestial arc? Why even put the arc in there? Why does he need that language? Right. Same way. Talks about heaven. Heaven is above the sub-celestial arc. There's also some circulation in the heavens going around. In other words, take anything. And then we can open up to Proclus. And we'll deal with it, because that's the way he writes. What's the trouble? The trouble is when he explains that piece, he's going to talk to you about its, its metaphysical position in terms of the whole thing. And therefore, you've got to wade through his metaphysics to find its meaning. And he has one other feature. He will always argue in here what is not true. And he'll then go on and talk about what other people think about the myth. <coughs> and he'll go into some detail about that. Don't get lost. <laughs> you can bracket it and keep going. Because you might forget that it's a knot and then find yourself confused between the positive assertion and negative one. So what are the difficulties? One is he's going to describe whatever he is doing both in terms of the myth, he's also going to talk about it in terms of his metaphysics. When he talks about it in terms of his metaphysics, he's going to run up and down to position these comments within the whole structure of his metaphysics. Okay. So, uh, <coughs> keep one thing in mind, 
that's central to Proclus and to Plato. See, what's his goal? His goal really, in one sense, is incredible. It's weird. I shouldn't have taken this off, but let, let's assume it's still here for a moment. He's going to argue that this whole metaphysical system must have been in, must have been in Plato's mind when he wrote the work. And therefore, he's going to deal with every single word in such a way to show, hey, you know what, I'm pulling this out of Plato. That's what he also does in the Timaeus, Proclus' commentary on the Timaeus, which if you want a great work, we have it available in the Thomas Taylor Great Translation. What does he do? Word by word, right, line by line, he makes commentaries on it. And what does it show? It shows implicit in Plato's time is, is a whole sophisticated philosophical cosmology, ties into his metaphysics. See, that's the way he reasons. He has this system. He said, by the way, I pulled it out of Plato. Or he'll go here, here's the myth. It's obvious that it's this, it reflects this. What's his goal? To show that it all comes out of Plato, which is a, a, an astonishing claim to make. Because what does that mean about that dude, Plato, if the, all of that was implicit in his writings? Uh, that's quite a bit. So that's enough. I haven't said enough. So let's get a honky. Let's uh, play. Okay. Right. Think we should go by the old standard? Which is a, what? You forgot the old standard? Always call on Sean. Uncle Harry. <laughs> yeah, there he is. Look, right. What part of the myth? Or you can pass the buck. Uh, what about I mean, Barbara? I'm sure would, would take Good the source. Yeah. <laughs> Barbara, I'm sure would what? Just take the buck. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I think you're, that's fair. Take the buck. Is that a good principle? Always make Barbara work? Yeah. <laughs> what do you got? Want to try or pass the buck? Uh, I'd, I'd like to pass it to Jack. I heard she did some nice work in New York. She, All right. She build on those successes. Mm -hmm. I'm going to pass the book. Okay, I'll pass it to someone. Um, I'll pass it to you. Good, Mark. Yeah. She passed Mark. it to you, Mark. <laughs> I, I don't have a specific See, place yet. It's in the book. Yes. Yeah. So, I'm in the book because I'm looking. Oh. Here. No, no, stuff here. Oh. <clears throat> well, oh, the uh, re remember now the repeated term he uses is the triad. Right? Triad, 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 triad. existence or being whatsoever, right? There are three things you can say about it, right? That is to say, um, it is, it has some power to be what it is, Even this chalk, there must be something that keeps all the parts together. And that allows us, that power allows a certain way in which it can function, or its activity, as he calls it. Okay, now, metaphysically, just to...
it follows the I a seer I am seeing something that I can call the seen object, right? One, two, three. In terms of the mind, right, we have a mind or an intellect that can be intellecting something intelligible. Now, this middle term, I call it intellect as intellecting the intelligible. He calls it intellectual intelligible. So in the symposium, there's the vision of ultimate reality, right? Bang! Right? Most brilliant light of being. <clears throat> right. With all the terms that are appropriate that we found from Myra, right? Okay? Now, in that moment, you know you're seeing. You are experiencing something, right? Hmm. And you know the thing that you are experiencing is nothing other than what's intelligible. Uh-uh, see? Intellect is turning upon itself to encounter what is intelligible. There's a process going on. See, there's a process. That's the middle term. Therefore, this too is a triad. One, two, three. See, one, two, three, one, two, three, right? So, so this is key. This is key. One, two, three. Therefore, there is something called the intellect, which we call noose, right? And it is apprehending the intelligible. One, two, three. That's a triad. So fundamental to him, right? what is, is the intelligible. Then this activity of seeing, or knowing, or what do you want to call it, right? Then that activity of seeing <coughs> turns upon itself and returns to the intelligible. That's intellect. All you can also put it in terms of a progression, right? An activity, a return. So that's just a quick sketch. So let's find a place to go in Proclus and play. Yeah, okay, bro. Proclus. Thought we were looking for a place in the Yes, pit. let's do that. You want to oh, do wait, that wait, 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 wait. Uh, <laughs> no, I Here we are working right button. ahead and forgetting important things. <laughs> uh, Nancy Flynn, as some of you know, she's uh, decided to come back and take a look. And we have two other new people, of course. And Amy and Yanni, please say hello. Excuse me for being rude, right, which is normal. Okay. So. Now, he's not, he's not Plotinus. That's where he, uh, he, he does. He's not a Plotinus, so... We'll do that later. Okay. okay. So where's your book? Uh, Proclus? I don't have one. That was on, on uh, the web. On the, didn't you get one? Email? We sent it to you in email. Yeah. yeah.
Would you like to read I the wrong one? I didn't bring it because I didn't know what we were doing tonight. Would you like to read okay, so you're a visitor tonight. I can buy one. I'll buy a book. I don't know whether you could or not. Why don't you find out? I mean, I guess... If you don't work, I'll make fun of you. I want to, I want to read it. <laughs> I don't mind. Oh, I'll borrow one from Julie. Well, Proclus states that, that one? There was a written. Everybody got it on email. I'm, how much is the book? Proclus states there are three states. Proclus. Proclus states there are three states. The celestial, the earthly, and the in-between. That's his, that's his first premise. That's whether that's the issue of whether the idea of heaven is sensible or not. Yeah, that's right. No, I got it. By the way, he rejects that later. But that's his first premise. And like he says, he always comes up. Let's with, do it. Let's not. do it. No, no, forget what I say. The hell with it. He says, "What is not?" And you get caught up with what is. Okay, look here. Let, let, let's, let's, let's do this the way we were thinking. Um, see, up to chapter four. Hey, up to chapter four, that's his metaphysics. That's, he's going to apply that to the myth. So you're not going to find anything in the first four chapters dealing with the myth. Agree? Are we talking book four, chapter four? And chapter four, he then gives a summary of where he's going on chapter four. Book four or book five? Well, five he starts in with Zeus uh, book leading. Book four the... or book five? Oh, I'm only in, in book four. Book four. Of yes. Book four, book four chapter four. All right, just if we were going to pick up the point that was just made by Arthur, then we're in Chapter 5, Book 4. You care to do it? Or want to go anywhere else? Come on. Chapter 5, Book 4? Book You're correct. Four, chapter. Do you want to do that? Come on, or give me some other alternative. I, I don't oh, Of course, Arthur offered that. We, we do it, okay? Yes, yes. Okay, look at the opening, look at the opening sentence. What do you notice about the opening sentence? It was similar to your question. It was similar to your question. Why the two levels? Which one are we talking about? What? Therefore, is the heaven to which Zeus leads the gods. Right? Okay. See? There's Zeus. Right. We're in the myth now. Zeus is in the next world. And, uh, everyone's having, as it were, a good time. There it is. So, there's a heaven. And within the heaven, there is Zeus, who's going to lead all the other gods and the souls 
up to the highest heaven, and up here there's a banquet. So therefore he says, hey, what is this uh, heaven to which Zeus leads the gods? These are two possibilities. Whatever we mean by heaven is uh, sensible. Right? Which really means all the terms that you're acquainted with dealing with the physical world are applied here to the idea of heaven. So he's going to take this idea, this understanding of the idea of heaven, as what? All the things you can say about it where we borrow terms from this world and apply it to those. That's his first approach. He's saying, okay, let's try it. Many people have said that. For if we should say that it is the sensible heaven, as certain other persons say it is, it, it, it will be necessary that the more excellent genre should be converted to things naturally subordinate to themselves. Hmm. That's the first claim, right? What's the claim? If it is true, some certain things should follow. What should follow? Naturally subordinate. There should be, yeah, 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 yeah. Then he deals with the implications for it. Zeus, Jupiter, the mighty leader of the heavens, proceeds to this sensible heaven and leads it, all the gods that follow him, you will have a conversion to things subordinate. And posterior means after himself. So he's going to deal with the implications of what follows if you think you can apply sensible terms to his idea of heaven. And he's going to go here into this paragraph and give you all of the consequences that follow from such an idea. Okay? Therefore, you have to swim through this negative case. into the next paragraph, nothing but dealing with the implications of this notion. Until the next paragraph, he says, How therefore do these things accord with those who make heaven to be sensible? For souls do not contemplate and dance around intelligibles through this uh, circulation of the heavens, but through the unapparent convolution of souls. What, what's he doing? And again and again, he's going to say, hey, I'll give you the reasoning it follows when other people say something different than himself. And he's going to deal with the implications of it in terms of his metaphysics. Right? It doesn't fit. So he's going to reject it. Would you agree we have clear support of this in the paragraph that starts, but if someone should say that the heaven is intelligible, Got that paragraph? Okay, now we have a different view. Now we want to know, hey, then in the myth, this is what it is. It's the intelligible. Oh! 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 Then in our, in our great picture that we had a moment ago, right? He's saying the intellect is intellecting the intelligible. Hey, you know what that means? That means this is ultimate reality. That's ultimate reality. 
Oh, wow. That's a wow experience, as my grandson calls it. Wow. And it's metaphysics, aren't we? And then we're going to go back and see whether it fits the... But if someone should say that the heaven is intelligible, to which inspired narrations of Plato consentaneously to the nature of things and what follow the most celebrated of his interpreters. For Pla Plotinus, Iamblichus, all of these guys say heaven is a certain intelligible. So what does he do? He says, hey, Plotinus, Iamblichus, they all agree with me. And prior to these, Plato himself and the Cratylus, following the Orphic theologian, Theogenes, calls the father indeed Zeus, Kronos, but of Saturn or heaven or Uranus to change those words. The father indeed is Zeus or Jupiter, Kronos, but of Kronos, Uranus. And he figures Zeus is the demiurgos of the whole of things. Right. Okay. He jumped into the time is. Look. Right. In theology. Here's a picture, of course, you can recognize it right away. Of God. Right. Agree that for the creation, there has to be a model. Sometimes called the idea in the mind of God. This is the intelligible. So in the time is, God then contemplates the ideal, the idea in the mind of God for all of creation, and from that, he uses that as the model to, for the outpouring of the cosmos or the universe. So the universe is a copy. This is the model. By the way, would you agree, uh, Miss Miss, would you agree that what you have is something that you possess and isn't you, but something you possess? No. Come again? <laughs> no. Would you agree, I have this chalk? Yes. I'm not the chalk, but I possess the chalk. Right. And therefore, whatever I possess or have is different from me. Therefore, it has an existence apart from me. Agree? Sure. Therefore, <clears throat> this idea of the mind of God must be separate from God and must have its own kind of existence. Therefore, this is called the Cronian mind, or Kronos. Uh, uh, Miss, Miss, would you agree, whatever exists, there must be a cause? Yes, sir. Necessarily, or? Mm -hmm. Oh, oh. Unless it always is. Oh, then. Whatever anyone experiences, regardless of what it is, there should be a cause for it if there is something they experienced? Yes. Therefore, if they experience the intelligible, there must be a cause to it? Oh, so. oh, oh, oh. Heaven, Uranus. Mm. Right? So the cause of this in mythology is Uranus, or heaven. <laughs> So, uh, there's a key relationship then between Kronos and heaven or Uranus. It's the source of Kronos, and it's being used in creation by the Demiurgos, that's what it's called, the God that works, Demiurgos. One, two, three. So that's what he's doing, see? And, um, he shows that Kronos is connective. See, it's connective. Have a divine intellect. Right? Not just intellect, divine intellect. And that heaven is the intelligence 
or hey, the intellectual perception of the first intelligibles. This is an intellectual perception of the intelligibles, right? Because you can put you here, and if you're experiencing the nature of reality, right, then notice the language I can use. The intellectual perception of the first intelligibles, there's more than one, right? The intellectual perception of the intelligibles, you know what that is? Ah, what else would you expect, Kronos? And that heaven is the intelligence. Right? Heaven is the intelligence. What is intelligence? Would you agree it must be uh, must be the consequence of using the intellect to perceive the intelligible, then you have intelligence. It's a result. Isn't Understanding. It? Yeah, content. Yeah, 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 yeah. So look what we're doing, see? We're going back into mythology here, right? The Cratylus. And, and now he's now describing with these key terms certain processes that take place here and he's going to use a philosophical way of describing it that becomes his metaphysics now what are we still working on? heaven <clears throat> or we can talk about it in terms of mythology as you're right on so, uh, he shows that Kronos is connective of, of a divine intellect and that heaven is the intelligence. See, it's the intelligence. Heaven is the intelligence. It's the result of the experience. Right? Because you can't have intelligence unless you encounter the intelligible and you need the intellect to actively perceive the intelligible, and as a result, you have intelligence. Ah, but still talking about what he means by the word heaven. Look what he's putting in there now. Heaven is the uh, intelligence. It's the uh, intellectual perception of first intelligibles. For sight, says he, looking to the things above is heaven. Hence, heaven subsists prior to the divine intellect with which the mighty Kronos is replete. But it intellectually perceives the things above, such as beyond the celestial order. Ah, therefore, if there's going to be a celestial order, we know it's beyond it. Ah, the mighty Uranus therefore, Uranus, therefore, is allotted a kingdom which is between the intelligible and intellectual orders. Oh, so now what's he doing? He's saying, oh, oh, I can take these ideas in my, in my metaphysics and I can say there's something between two major ideas and I can then talk about that and relate that between these two ideas and oh, identify that idea in the myth. Looker, if this is the you know if this is the first time you're into this, this is absurd, or so overly complex. Yeah, you know, that's right. But look what he's trying to do. He's trying to say that what's behind a myth necessarily is an intellectual system of metaphysics, and you can relate one to the other, and therefore everything he says about the myth. And the way in which he says it is unique, precise, and you can understand it by then finding its necessary location in his metaphysics. <clears throat> Curious way of going? Oh. 
And by the way, uh, it takes them six books to do all this. Because after he finishes the Phaedrus, he's going to do the same thing with Plato's Parmenides. And then he's going into referencing to the Republic, and he's going to do the same thing to the Republic. He's going to go through all the major dialogues and shows that it fits within his vast metaphysics. The last book was lost. And Thomas Taylor, the genius as he is, no one has ever, ever, I, I don't believe anybody could have done it, other than someone with his background. He, re, he puts together the seventh book, he authored the seventh book, and says, by the way, I know Proclus so well, I can tell you what he must have said about the gods. <coughs> and therefore brings all the gods and shows their position metaphysically and shows how each of the gods represent a particular metaphysical principle, and therefore the gods are the personification of philosophical principles, and he pulls it all together in sets of triads. A startling genius. Yeah. So, we push, right? And uh, what's nice about uh, this section if you really want to look at it, this whole issue is only in one paragraph. That's all he's got. That's all he needs is one paragraph. And that's why it's dense. It's compact. And just to, to pull you back into the myth, notice the last uh, sentence in this uh, paragraph we're in. Mm -hmm. Or the last two sentences mm -hmm. of your life. <clears throat> right, the whole of heaven, right, Uranus, is established according to this medium and that it contains the one bond of the divine order, being the father indeed of the intellectual genus, being generated from the kings prior to it, which also it is said to see. Last sentence. But on, the, on one side of it, the super celestial place, and on the other, the sub celestial arc must be arranged. So the end of this paragraph, you know what, now we can now place the other two major ideas and that therefore comes the next couple of par next couple of chapters where he deals with each one. Uh, just a quick, before we move on from the, the Demiurgos, Kronos, and Uranus, uh, just so I, I, I think I'm getting that, that 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 is a royal form of the triad that we were talking about when we were talking about the intellect mm -hmm. intellecting intelligible. the intelligible. Yeah. And that, that's in it, that it's in its royal form. That's right. Okay. Yeah. 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 And, and, to, and on every level he's going to have a different triad. Okay. And uh, what I don't quite get is when we say intelligence, that's that subsumes that, 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 that triad exists in that in intelligence? So, do you think it's possible that if someone had one of those experiences, they may end up with something? I would hope so. Yeah. What would you call it? Intelligence? Yeah, I would say the same okay. thing. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, therefore, there is an See, there's an intelligence, but that presupposes that when it's gone through that triad in order to perceive it, then what you, what you can then talk about it is the residue or whatever you get, you can formalize it as intelligence. Yeah. yeah.
Now, uh, now, uh, okay. Let me let me say one more thing about this. Since this work is developed, hey, this work is developed. like chapter one, see, first book. All he's going to do is deal with one or two ideas, and then for every succeeding chapter, he's adding, he's building, continuously building a whole vocabulary and philosophical system step by step, which he then uses. Therefore, all of the terms that are new to you and puzzling, every one of them has been developed earlier. We're jumping into the fourth book. Therefore, if you decide to go through it, you really you have to build and understand his vocabulary and the way he's using all of these terms. And he sets them out in order, perfect order, all the way up to book four, all the way through the whole book. Like here, he uses many ideas. One is the intelligible orders. It won't mean anything to you because he doesn't make that clear in this section. But he does in a previous section, you see. So in a way, you're learning a new language. It's learning a new language. is learning metaphysics, which is a new language to apply to these curious things such as mythology, Plato's dialogues, Plato's myths, that's what he's doing. Now, another way of playing the game is to go say, look here, what is the highest, what's the highest point this guy is making? You know, let me know. Anything really profound, what might be the most profound insight he has? Then if you could get an answer to that, then you go to that section in the book and you open up and see what you can learn. But remember though, it presupposes vocabulary, building. But you still can use it, still see a great deal. How much work does it take, Mark? What did you do? <laughs> About four years. Right. Plowing through it. So, let me give you this challenge, okay? You see what it takes. Do you want to do any more, or should we shift and do another dialogue? Or something else? Because... This is really, this would really be a study group that wants to work together to do this. And that means you have to put in a lot of time. And then you have to be left with one question. So what? You know, so what? Right? So you did it all. Is it worth it? What do you get for it? Yeah, it's worth it. See, in the old days, <coughs> this and a nickel could give you a ride on the subway, but they raised the price. But you felt good about it. No. You knew what seat you wanted. I was in New York. Hey, I got a subway ride. Four bucks. It used to cost a nickel. <laughs> <laughs> My old neighborhood is gone. No. Uh, we used to be able to get into the subways in a different way. Yeah. Get a pack of cigarettes and you used to have tin foil on it. And you take it off and you keep folding it over, over and over and over. So you get a little square, exactly the diameter of a nickel, and then you scrape all the edges off, and you stick it in the slot, and you get a free ride. <laughs> I would never do that, no. except oh. when I needed to. <laughs> four bucks, it went from hey, a nickel to four. That's a jump. 
Yeah. How about a cup of coffee? Yes. When? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. You like that idea. Hey, what do you want to do? Want to do a dial and another different dialogue? What do you want to do? Yeah. Up to you guys. Where do you want to go? Well, if we take this model, Pierre, and we say that within ourselves we become Zeus. If you want to do this, take one of them, and if you want to come over, talk to me with <clears> the <throat> book over coffee, I'll be glad to do it with you. Mm -hmm. right. But that means you have to do, the, you have to do a, a justifiably a good piece of homework. Right. You mean Especially if you had a high point. Pardon this, me? I thought you, oh, you well, let's get a small group and work. Not necessarily alone. But that means that we contain the gods within ourselves. That's it. If we become the Zeus. Mm -hmm. And we are the director. Macro, micro. Yeah. Micro, macro. So that's what you get out of this. Yeah, that's where it's going. Yeah. yeah. Hot. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> okay, what do you think? More. New dialogue. New title. I'll go for, I'll go for a new one. Couple of answers. Come on, a couple of ones. Give me a name. Um, what what one? Marty wants a symposium. Yeah. Which one? I'm asking Marty if he wants to do the symposium. Symposium. Daniel, you want to do the Atatus? Mm. Well, I think symposium because it, it deals with uh, there's nominally uh, love. It seems to be what it's about, but it's totally different. Okay. If we do the symposium, it's going to be the same thing. All right. You will find every single word fits together with others. It's a vast tapestry. Every single idea you thread with others and link them together to see the exquisite figure that's uh, being composed. Therefore, all right? It's, it's difficult to see it unless you know what you're looking for. Sure. Right. Agree? It, it's very strange. Would you agree that once you change your cars, you suddenly are able to spot your new car on the road all over the place that you always ignored <laughs> before that? Yeah. Right? Right. Liquor. Yeah. Right. You can see the magnificent order in the symposium if you decide to go over Socrates' speech first. Or it's going to be very difficult to see all the beauty. See, the trouble with reading a dialogue, if you always you should really agree to this. Never read it the first time. <laughs> Read it? Well, because you can't get the first them. time. You have to read it the second time. So you have to read it the second time or the third time. That happens to me all along. Oh, <laughs> always. <laughs> okay. All right. I Look here. It this is why. All right. Look here. Here's one. You have to master right, the last paragraph in the symposium. Right. Take the last two paragraphs if you want, but certainly the last paragraph. Right. You have to master the introduction. You have to see that the introduction anticipates the whole. You have to see that the conclusion to the dialogue demands that you reread the entire thing over again in a new way. Totally. Right. Right. Can you do the same thing for the Phaedrus? Pardon me? Could you do that structuring for the Phaedrus? Oh, yeah. As a matter of fact, the opening line in the Phaedrus and the conclusion are the same, right? O beloved Pan, O beloved Phaedrus, O file Pan, O file Phaedrus. Same words, too. So, so this pattern yeah. fits that as well? Yeah, okay. Right. To be able to see this, however, now, uh, you then have a series of speeches, and then Socrates' speech, 
and Alcibiades' speech. They have to go together. If you do that, you'll see why the introduction is exactly the way it is and why everything fits. Okay. Um, each one of these speeches that precedes Socrates' speech, it's a masterful work of appearance and reality. It appears that each of these speakers is saying one thing, but they're really saying another. And you have to cut through the appearance and find the reality in each one of these true speakers. In other words, you have to discover what they really mean by the camouflage they're putting up. Right. Now, this is a speech about the nature of love. So each of the people have to give up, get up and give a full dress oration in praise of love from their own experience, from their own lives. Therefore, there are going to be totally different views of it. And therefore, we do not agree when we talk about love, there are all still kinds of difficulties, complications, ambiguities, etc. in each of our views. So too with each of these speeches. So you have to be able to break the, the appearance from reality. There's also a progression through this. And you have to see that it's an apparent progression, not a real one, and know why. Um, if you then get into Socrates' speech, you'll understand then why the meadow and the Phaedrus speech is such that he describes it. Right? You can interrelate dialogue, see, once you play this game. So therefore, if you decide, if we want to go into the symposium, right, master these two speeches, right, make sure you understand the great challenge in the end, see the introduction, and then be able to see each of these speeches that precede him over the issue of appearance and reality. Master which two speeches? Alcibiades. Master which two speeches? Alcibiades and Socrates? Mm -hmm. So far, you're following. Okay. Why do you think you weren't? Because of... Well, I'm verifying, I guess. Oh, oh, okay. I usually charge for verification. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we do if we want to do it. That, is that where we're going? Think? Yes, yes, okay, okay, okay. Mm. Oh. Mm. Say it again, please. Well, uh, <coughs> Good. That's, that was better. The second one was better, wasn't it? Mm. <laughs> I, I can see you guys have grown while I'm in Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Mm. Mm.